please welcome Rebecca Ruiz, Senior Features Writer at Mashable, in conversation with Amber Heard, actress, activist, and human rights champion of the United Nations Human Rights Office. to be joined by Amber Heard, actress and Hi. activist. Um, Hello. Yes. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Um, and first, I want to talk a little bit about something you all may not know, which is that Amber has a very long track record of being an activist and advocate. I was wondering about that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Hmm. Can we get mic check? Let's see. I don't know what I think okay. I do about mics. But <laughs> she, she's coming. Thank you. Here, let's sit closer and you can, can yeah. together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, Amber, <laughs> Amber has a very long track record, which I'd love for her to tell us a little bit about. Um, she started very young as an advocate and activist, and maybe just yeah. walk us back there. <laughs> You're like, um, yeah. So I started, uh, I guess I started volunteering when I was like 12 or something. Um, and it seems very, you know, oh, how lofty, but um, I was probably required to do so for school or something. Um, but this weird thing happened. I uh, started really loving it and not loving it uh, for a reason, especially uh, as a 12 year old, um, that my 12 year old brain couldn't, could describe. I loved it because it gave me back something. Uh, and uh, I started volunteering at a soup kitchen before school because um, you know I didn't have time to do it any other time other than summers. So every morning before school, you know, started going there, and um, I, I I I think that's when I got addicted to the to the give back, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about people, and um, and and really not what separates us, but what, really what, what how similar we are. And uh, I moved to LA when I was young. I had no money, um, as all you know, uh, starving actors are when they first moved to LA, especially. So I looked for ways in which I could be involved, and um, and and looked also at the resources I had. And having nothing um, but time, I wound up uh, finding uh, a way I could work for um, children's children's hospitals or work with children in um, in children's hospitals. And um, I guess there. Uh, well, I still do today. Um, I guess working in those hospitals for me has uh, has has really um, taught me um, the main component of service, which is humanity. The humans are they are the core component of of service, and I think that. Um, you know, has translated also into my uh, activism now. Um, now I have the opportunity uh, to go on missions, uh, as well as, you know, raise attention, funds, uh, you know, support, advocate for um, various uh, causes and nonprofits. I have the ability to sometimes, um, uh, you know, participate on these missions. Um, so many years ago, the uh, I, I, you know I accompanied Amnesty International um, on their research missions and humanitarian missions on the border, both on the north and south side of the border, um, uh, to uh, translate for and to interview and to advocate for and to help um, the refugees and migrants. Um, uh, fleeing their um, their home countries uh, in, in 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 seek of uh, refugee. I mean, in seek of refuge, um, and uh, and the sheer minor hope that they could make a better life for themselves. And uh, then last, eight, and I did that for a long time, and I loved that work. I mean, I spoke to people on throughout the wide range of of their uh, of their process, their arduous and dangerous process of seeking asylum, um, and uh, you know, from deportation camps to um, depot centers on both sides of the borders, jails, and I sat through sentencing hearing, hearings, interviewed. Um, you know, victims of, of um, a wide range of violence, specifically uh, women, 
Uh, and hearing their stories and collecting that kind of information, imbibing that information was, um, it's just a, you know, uh, it's informs a huge part of who I am now. And then last April, I just returned from Zatari in Jordan, um, which hosts the largest Syrian refugee camp. Um, it's uh, home to uh, thousands, tens and tens and thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands of people, um, over, well over half of whom are children. And it is there that I, um, you know, got to see firsthand, um, you know, a different side of, uh, of the work, which is, um, you know, is somewhere in between um, the two places in between the eyes of the people, the individuals with whom I've had the honor, privilege, luck, fortune to be able to serve and, and, and advocate on behalf of. Um, you know, I went on a medical mission. Um, the la the, this one I'm speaking of right now was a medical mission which deliver with the Syrian American Medical Society, and they deliver a life-saving uh, aid to um, people in, the, in this particular camp and others. And I, it's there I got to see firsthand really the, the, what this kind of work really does mean to me. It's, it's not in the eyes of the little girl who uh, it looks at you and, and is full of hope and joy and, and, and optimism. Uh, and resilience and is looking forward to a future and fighting day in and day out to live another day in one of the world's most disheartening and disparaging places. But also in the eyes of the, the countless individuals who have forfeited the comforts uh, of their own beds on the other side of the world, um, it, it paid for flights and left the comforts of this world to uh, find themselves uh, sweating endless days, shoulder to shoulder, next to other doctors, uh, performing impromptu surgeries in makeshift hospital hallways in which they are cramped among a million other volunteers and refugees seeking uh, 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 life-saving medical care at whatever uh, chance they may have in getting it and to see them forfeit yet another night's sleep for yet one more surgery for yet another person just because they can physically more or less do it <laughs> and to, to see them do that countless day in and day out see the eyes in their face uh, look, look in their eyes and see what it gets for them makes me understand um, why we as humans can't help but forget um, how interconnected we all are. And it's not about, um, you know, uh, what, what, what nonprofit you're working for, what, what your cause is. It's the constant reminder that all of us here in this room, or else you would not be sitting here, uh, care about inherently. It's the thing that I'm reminded of um, every day when you do this kind of work. It's that we're all human. We're fighting for, I'm fighting for me. I'm fighting for, in essence, what makes me human. And that's why um, when I started developing a relationship with the United Nations Human Rights, I found, uh, I could not have found uh, an institution more aligned with my core principles or values, an institution um, that was uh, founded on and, and serves to represent and protect uh, the articles that set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I gotta say, um, it's 70th year today. I mean, so this is its 70th birthday, not today, but this year. And 70 years later, it's just as salient and profound as it was then, it is now. Wow. <laughs> we, we actually have video um, from one of your humanitarian oh. trips um, to that refugee camp. Do we wanna play that, Shush. please? Uh, so I just finished, um, it was my first day here at Zatari. Uh, we went to Sam's uh, medical center. Uh, couldn't believe how many people there were. Uh, 
in need of real medical attention and uh, and yet everybody greeted me with a smile uh, and I feel really honored that I could um, get to know Sam's. Um, I got to actually see the work they're doing. I got to see how much more is needed. Um, I, I think that's the, the biggest impact for me is, is seeing uh, uh, um, the fight, the spirit, the, the fortitude and the resilience in, in the people. You know, and the little girl who hugged me and sat in my lap, who has, uh, um, uh, you know, a terrible uh, uh, infection of, uh, for psoriasis, but she was smiling and laughing and giggling with me, and, and, and I mean, that, how can that, yeah. that means the world to me, to see it firsthand, see what, where it goes. <laughs>
for her long-standing advocacy and support on behalf of advocacy on behalf of women's rights. That piece of history, combined with the fact that I had that respect for her, really cemented in me what I think you know, was said best uh, by Secretary Clinton at the UN when she said, women's rights are human rights. And then I later find out Eleanor is, is responsible. She was the first chair. Um, she was the first chair for the UN um, Commission of, on Human Rights. And then um, to learn that she was greatly responsible for the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was uh, adopted 70 years ago, uh, w was pretty profound. I mean, th to see it codified. And the, the things that I had always felt uh, drove and informed my advocacy through my years. Um, you know, whether it was a, on a play yard in school or in a soup kitchen or in a, in a refugee camp. And those principles um, uh, uh, are articulated, protected, and really, um, uh, and, and really distilled in, in that declaration. Think about it, it was a declaration laid out 70 years ago. Uh, despite how much the world has changed in an unprecedented way, how, how it has changed not just for us in this part of the world, it's changed at an accelerated pace, unprecedented uh, before in known history. Uh, but to add the, uh, add the additional factor of it being universal, uh, is to codify a, a, a set of principles that are meant to be representative of some of the most ubiquitous and, and uh, lasting universal rights uh, that we inherently all know uh, we deserve that are inherent to us. There's a reason why the first articles, one and two, which lays out all human beings are free and equal, and that we all, no matter your gender, your race, your creed, your color, your, your political opinion, lack thereof, we all deserve to be free and equal. That is, there's a reason it resonates with all of us, and all of us feel as though we deserve it. And that document, um, as it lays out in, in, in so many articles, is still applicable and upholds today. I can't think of it, uh, really anything that does. Constitutions need to be amended, creeds need to be updated, religious uh, uh, principles need to be adapted and changed, uh, or sometimes aren't, but you know, are. So, so I, and to also exacerbate that metric with how much um, of the world, the different cultures to which it's applicable or should, should apply. It's an incredible feat to think that this declaration could very much embody the essence of what it means to be a responsible, ethical, moral human being that's also motivated to protect that in others because to protect it in others is to protect it in you. See what I mean? It's just... <laughs> um, We've been talking about um, big values and principles, right, and these big ideas. Um, what about action? What is your call to action for this moment in time, which is yeah. a very turbulent one? This is, the, this, is the coolest, this is the coolest thing to me because you're asking me this question now in 2018. What month is it again? <laughs> You're asking me this question now in 2018, which would be such a fundamentally different question a second ago, not one second, but a, a year ago, uh, 10 years ago. I can't even imagine 70 years ago before, you know, when this <laughs> was initially adopted. You're asking me a question about action now. And the cool part of that is you have never been more powerful. We have never been more powerful than we are right now. It's never been a better time to be alive. Yes, there are so many injustices in the world. There are so many things wrong. So far we have to come. But we are not only enjoying the fruits of so many years of 
intense work done by thinkers, our, our ancestors and humanity to get us to a point we are now at with unprecedented ability to do so from our hand, literally in your hand. I'm just pointing at the one phone I see. But in your hand is the power to change the world and it's not hyperbole. It's evidence in the fact that look at how different the world was two and a half years ago. There was no movement in the, in the streets uh, um, there, uh, there were, uh, to address women's issues specifically. There was no one saying her story. What about her? There was no Me Too. There was no presence of that. There was no energy. It was a fundamentally different two and a half years ago than it is today. Why? Not because activists, uh, not because celebrities or activists or politicians or people in power stood up and made the change, or, not because uh, uh, it, the, the points were salient and resonated. No, it's because now we have finally reached a, the, 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 the pinnacle where, or the, the, the pinnacle of the collision between our awareness of our place in the world with, with technology and our unprecedented ability to be increasingly connected to an increasingly gl growing global community. We now have met that with our ability to do something with it. We are now burdened, but also driven by unprecedented levels in, of access to information, involvement, community and power. The power you can see in the streets, you can see in the way that yesterday I was in discussion uh, amongst people that don't work in my field and I remember asking very politely, a woman and a man were speaking and they were talking about wages and she was mentioning, you know, she overheard how much her, her the guy, the, uh, her, ma her male colleague has make, is making and was hired with, even though she was far, far more qualified and had been there longer. And she said, I went home and I felt, I felt so bad. And I said, I asked her politely, well, can I ask you what you did? Because I understand that. I, make, I am a white woman I make a, in the United States. So I can at best make 80 cents to my male counterpart's dollar. And that's not the case in, in my in industry. It's far, far worse in my industry. But let's say, just working, in the United States. I know going home, I would have gone home and said, okay, well, you know, I'd rather have the 80 cents and have my job than to lose all together, not be able to feed and support my family and have the next person take it for 80, 75 even, who knows. I know it's harder to do the other thing, which is to have asked your boss to, to have demanded more, to have stood up and said, may I ask what the starting salary for this gentleman was since we are, have the same qualifications, for example. So I was just curious because two and a half years ago, I wouldn't have thought of it. I have been complaining with this big mouth I'm with, I've been burdened with, sorry. I've been complaining and talking about this and trying to engage this discussion since I arrived in Hollywood 16 years ago. But in the last three years, seeing the energy, the support, the galvanization, uh, the grassroots uh, 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 support that's come up uh, to change the communal cultural conversation and attitude made it possible for me to not even imagine not asking her, what did you do? And she, much to my relief, said, I went to my boss, I demanded more. And I said, and it worked, and she said, oh yeah, it did, but it was not the point. The point was, the harder thing to do was definitely that, I'm sure, is to risk, especially if you are a woman, and I, I tend to be, find, I'm focused on women's rights um, uh, and women's issues, but, but I think that's because there are also <laughs> men's rights and men's issues as well. But I have noticed myself the power that we all have. Uh, uh, Mara up here speaking a few minutes ago, perfect example. Uh, it's no longer the job of activists or uh, 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 solely for activists, because I'd still like to be a part of the conversation. Uh, it's no longer the job for politicians or, or uh, 
or outdated institutions. It's our job to make the world we want to live in. And it's not only our job, we actually can. It's evidenced every single day. We see the Me Too and the Time's Up and the Black Lives Matter and you name it. All of, the, all of these groups were started not by you know, people like me taking a stand, rising up, although I hope I added to some support in that. For, I hope I lend my platform, which I feel very blessed and honored to have. I hope it supported, but for uh, my voice was able to be lent, but to, to help someone who might not have found their own voice. But really, the change was made by the people in this room. Everyone now owns the power, and I think that's the coolest thing. That, that's the coolest answer I could give you because you're asking me this now, and it's changed as evidence as what happened in just two or three years in my life. How differently. Some of my issues were handled then versus now is a perfect example. The power is now in all of our hands. And I am so excited to live in this world because it's, it's much more representative of the world we want to live in. It's ours. I love ending on that, right? The power is in all of our hands and we just need to use it. So thank you so much, Amber. Thank you. Yeah.